Welcome to season two of the Therapist of Millions podcast, where we get under the skin and into the brains of leading therapists and coaches from around the globe to find out what makes them tick and how they are helping those on the front lines of mental health around the world. Hello and welcome to the Therapist to Millions, where we get under the skin and into the brains of the leading therapists from around the world and all the way from NYC. <laughs> <laughs> we have Rachel Wright, who is a, a relationship, sex, and mental health therapist. She is recognized as one of the freshest voices on modern relationships and sex. With a master's degree in clinical psychology, Rachel has worked with thousands of humans worldwide. I love that, humans. Uh, helping them scream less and screw more. That is just genius. And <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome to the show, Rachel. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. This is very exciting. What an absolutely fantastic introduction. It's my favorite one so far. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks. thanks. Okay, so give us a little bit of a background. So what, how did you get to where you are now? What's your backstory? Tell oh, us man. <laughs> how long do we have? Um, you know, I I knew I wanted to be a therapist from a very young age. Uh, I grew up doing theater and um, uh, my, my parents sent me to therapy when I was like, I think almost 15, about 15. And I remember coming out of my first therapy session. And I said to my mom in our minivan, I was like, if I am not on Broadway, which is hilarious now, uh, if I'm not on Broadway, I want to be a therapist. Mm -hmm. And she was like, after one session, like, okay, great. Okay. So sounds good. You know, whatever. And kind of from there, th those were my two loves. And I continued to to do theater and I continued to study psychology. And eventually I had to pick because that's what happens in, in life. Um, and and I chose psychology. It's, it's, you know, my passion. And I figured I can do theater on the side. And frankly, I don't think I'm cut out for the hustle and I can't dance a freaking lick. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we we chose the the sitting job where where I get to help people and still dig into emotion and story and you know it's I never realized how similar those two things were until I got deeper into my career um and then I started niching down over time you know I was always fascinated with relationships and sex and why people were so weird about sex and and why why relationships were just um so hard for people. I didn't, I wanted to understand and I wanted to understand what kind of made people tick and um, why the divorce rate was so high and, and what, you know, I had so many questions like why, 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 why? And I think that I was hoping becoming a therapist would answer some and, and it did some of them and others are still, are still open. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the long and short of it. And I've been, I've been practicing for a while now and it's, I, I love what I do and, and never want to stop. Fantastic. And it, it's quite funny, actually, because everything you see around you, whether it's like, you know, get a, a nicer house or a better job or more money or whatever, it all kind of leads to sex, really, because ultimately it's like you just want to attract that partner and, you know, sort of like get into a relationship and share the love. I don't know. I don't know many people that like, you know, wake up thinking I really want to be alone for the rest of my life. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And, you know, it's sex, relationships, mental health are like the three pillars of my work. And those three things inform such a majority of our life and and behavior and drive and and um we don't get taught about them and that's really one of the biggest answers that i learned along this journey was that i had to go get a freaking master's degree in clinical psychology to like learn how to have a conversation with someone that was effective and i'm like this is insane we got to teach these things like why why are only therapists being taught how to do this this should be like taught in kindergarten. I don't understand. Yeah. So, you know, it's a big part of why I've brought education into my work too, is um, to try to empower people to do some of this stuff on their own and, and not have to be in uh, a therapist's office or in a zoom meeting with a therapist to like have a hard conversation with their partner or family member. I love that. I'm just going to ask you a quick slide question on the slide. Have you ever had to act in any of your therapy sessions? Uh, yeah. All the time. <laughs> Imp improv skills, improv oh, skills. Yeah. I mean, I I've worked with and and I say that not because it was not a genuine response. Right. There, There's but sometimes you hear things and like especially at the beginning, I remember 
hearing things that I had never heard before. And now I've heard everything, right? Like nothing really phases me. I, I'm like, you can tell me anything. And I've probably heard it at least twice. Um, but at the very beginning, to to not have a face of like, oh, that's the first time I've ever heard that, right? Like someone tells you something exciting and it's similar to when someone tells you, you know, like I'm pregnant and you don't want to just burst into congratulations because you don't know if they're excited. Right. So like kind of the, yeah, the, yeah. the biggest act, act You're waiting in, for in them quotes. to kind of go, and it's a good thing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so in, at the beginning of being a therapist, it was the same thing. Someone would, you know, say, tell me a story. And my job is to remain neutral about my response until I kind of see where they're going with their response. And so that's where kind of that, that acting piece comes in because on the inside, you know, someone tells you something and you want to be like, oh, what? And really you have to sit there and like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and that's really important. And then of course, you know, sometimes genuine reaction is actually really helpful in a clinical setting. So just learning, learning when and how to, to utilize those tools is, is part of the work too. Okay, I'm going to ask you this question. I might have to edit this out, though, obviously. But uh, what's your most unusual case? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's really hard. I don't. I really don't find any of my cases or clients or anything unusual. I, I like I said, I've kind of heard everything now so many times that I think what we perceive to be out of the norm or weird or different. There's someone else out there going through the same thing or wanting the same thing. And I think that that's one of the biggest gifts that I've been given as a therapist is realizing that like we all think that we're the only ones that we're so weird and we're so, you know, messed up and we're so this and I'm the only one who's felt that. And in reality, like, no. You're not. You're not. And <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah, you're special in a good, in the best way. And then like, you're not special in the way of like, there's someone else out there experiencing it. And they may be halfway across the world. They may be right next door to you, but there is someone out there or many people out there experiencing the same thing. So nothing really sticks out as like, you know, this was so unusual. Cause I, I can't even think of one case. I mean, of course, everybody's details are different, right? But I can't even think of one time where something was so outlandish or so out there that I was like, take it. Yeah. Yeah. We're all just, <laughs> well, we're all I'm weird. <laughs> we're all weird. That's, yeah. that's the answer. Okay. Without any identifying factors, give us a, an example of a really good success story in your, in your practice. Oh, that's a great question. Um, okay. I, I had someone come to me. Um, they, when we first met, the reason why they came in was low libido. And this is a very common thing, right? And it's it's really interesting because there is no norm for what a libido should be, right? No one is like, it's not like a blood cell count. We're not like taking your blood and being like, oh, well, this is the, the normal range for a healthy blood, right? Like libido varies in everybody. And some folks are on the asexual spectrum and some folks are on the allosexual spectrum and they fall all throughout it. And so when someone says like, I'm, I want to work on my libido, it, we have to like figure out what their baseline is because we have to figure out if they're saying my libido is lower than I want it to be, or my libido is lower than it used to be, or right. Like what compared to what low libido compared to what? Yeah. So this person came in and said, I'm having really low libido. I, I love my partner. I want to be having more sex with them. And yet I don't want to help. And we work together. We've been, I still see this person like infrequently, but we still meet. It's been about three, three years, three, four, four years now. Um, wow. COVID really messed with my sense of time. Uh, it's been about four years now. And this person is, has now worked through, we figured out what shifted their libido down, which was the case. Their libido was higher. And then they experienced this drastic shift down. We figured out why that happened. We worked on communicating that to their partner. We worked on reintegrating physical touch. And now this person is having sex with their partner on average, like four times a week, which is what they, they wanted to, 
to kind of, this was like the milestone, the, the goal. And typically I don't encourage folks to make goals like that. Um, because it's just, you know, we got to like be in our body and do what feels good. Um, but for this person, it was like, it, before they came, when before their libido dropped, they were having sex like 15 times a week. And so, you know, hitting four felt like a really manageable thing for them. And, and they're very, uh, quantitative. So they wanted a number goal. Um, and so they did and it's happening. And, you know, now there's an open dialogue between my client and their partner, and they can actually talk about this stuff. And on weeks where they don't want to have sex, neither of them are filled with anxiety that it's never going to come back. Neither of them are, you know, thinking it's because they're not attracted to the other one or all of these other kind of stories or narratives that we can make up about why something is happening. Um, we're, we're meaning making machines, us humans. Um, so we take something like low libido, which could be caused by, you know, a million different things. And we're like, nope, it means this. They hate my ass. Right. And it's like, <laughs> actually not at all. So that, that's a really a, a great one. And I'm so proud of this person and, and the hard work that they've put into, to reach this point. Yeah. I mean, all sorts of, yeah, you like lack of uh, the poor nutrition, lack of sleep, you know, all sorts of things can affect it. I mean, you try going yeah. through three nights of not sleeping well and then feel like you want to have sex afterwards. You, you just want to sleep. <laughs> right. Right. Or medication, yeah. stress. Like, I, I mean, it literally the, the weather, like I, <laughs> it could be anything, <laughs> anything. You know, and, and some mornings I just wake up and I don't feel great and there's no reason. Right. But I just, I just go, oh, it's one of those days. I'm just going to go with it. Lean into yep. it. Yep. And like that, that has to be okay. Yeah. That sometimes we just, we're humans. We feel differently at different times for many different reasons. Yeah. I think when you, when you, when you become okay with being not okay, that that's kind of when, when it, when, yeah. It's Cause then also the days when you do feel great, it's like, oh, I'm going to be even more productive today. You know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then being able to communicate that to those around you. You know, whether that is your chosen family, your biological family, whatever, being able to say like, you know, I'm actually not feeling my best today and asking for support even or saying like, I don't need any support. I just wanted to name out loud that I'm not feeling 100 percent. And so if I'm a little sensitive today or a little shorter today, um, I wanted to give you the heads up. You know, communication goes a long way with this kind Absolutely. of stuff. What modalities do you use in your practice? Oh, tons. Um, I'm trained in Gottman, uh, couples therapy, which I integrate the, I love their stuff. It's also all of their research is only done on like middle-aged white people. So it, I have to be a little careful about like how it's applied. Um, but I really do love their stuff. Um, fundamentally, uh, I use some DBT in my work. I use some CBT in my work, um, imago therapy, um, some, a little bit of psychodynamic stuff, not a lot, uh, some IFS, uh, some somatic work. It's pretty eclectic. It's pretty eclectic. Yeah. 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 Do you do any MDR? No, you know, it's, I love EMDR and I never, it was never the quote unquote right time to go through the, it's a very long process to, to get certified in EMDR. And I took my practice online back in 2016, 2017. Um, and at that time, doing EMDR online was like not a thing. I know that some people are doing that now, which is so cool. Uh, but it was not a thing back then. And so I was like, okay, if I'm taking my practice online, I, I just won't. So I know I know enough about it to refer people to amazing EMDR therapists, but I don't practice it myself. There's a, a bit of a tip. I know one of our previous podcasts, uh, the, the lady was doing it. I can't remember who it was, but she was doing Zoom calls and she had a cat. She had one of the lights that goes back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At one point, the cat was jumping on the light and going, Wee! <laughs> <laughs> don't over the cat in the room. <laughs> yep, yep. That's that's really funny and makes a lot of sense. It's like a laser. Yeah. What, uh, what's the biggest challenge you're facing in your therapy practice right now? Mm. That's a good question. Um, you know, you hit me at a really interesting time because I, I was forced to take a month off because of my broken foot. And so I feel so refreshed and grateful to be back in my practice, seeing my clients. Um, 
I think one of the biggest challenges is honestly keeping up with administrative crap. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the client work to me is I, I love and could do all day, every day, the, the keeping up with like super bills and notes and this and calendars and kind of all of that side of things, I, I think is my biggest struggle. Um, yeah, I, that's kind of a boring answer, but it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've got a module on that. Yeah, we can help yeah. you with that one. <laughs> get Please get a VA. <laughs> yeah, I have an amazing assistant. I do. I really, she's wonderful. And sometimes just like, shit, heads up, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, how do you look after your own mental health? Mm. Um, I go to therapy. I have an amazing therapist uh, who doesn't just work with therapists, but has a lot of experience working with other therapists. Um, so she understands how to talk to me uh, in a way that doesn't allow me to BS anything, mm -hmm. um, which is very needed. Um, I also go to family therapy. I, I'm i non-monogamous. I have two primary partners that I live with. Um, and so the three of us go to family therapy. Um, and sometimes that changes into like couples, depending on if, you know, one dyad needs support in something. Um, and then I'm also about to do, I mentioned using DBT in my practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I am trained in it as a clinician, but I am about to start a DBT group as a client and go through it um, on the client side. And so I really try to like keep myself doing the things that I would recommend to my clients yep. because- you know, I, I also, I have depression. Um, I manage it and it's there. Um, I used to have panic disorder. I haven't had a panic attack in a while. Let me knock on some wood. Um, and so I understand what it's like to have a mental illness and I, and I understand what it's like to be in the throes of something like that. And so I, I try to take as best care of myself as possible so that I can then show up for, for everybody else too. That's brilliant. And what would your top tip for people being in, in the world of mental health now, just a general top tip. Oh, um, stop being so rigid. <laughs> uh, truly, like a adapt and grow. Um, you know, I remember when when COVID hit and people started having to see their clients virtually, there was so there were so many people like, oh, this isn't gonna work. This isn't, you know, I can't see their feet. I, I don't know what they're doing with their leg. Like <laughs> there were so many things that, that I heard therapists pushing back on. And I'm like, you guys, I've been virtual for like years now, you know, I, it, it can be as effective. And there are plenty of studies that show that. Um, and so it, that's just one example of like, go with the flow, move with the times, keep learning new things, evolve. If your client wants to try a walk and talk in the park. Like if your state allows that legally, try it, like try new things. And, and it's okay if they don't work and it's okay to say to your client, like, I've never done that before. That sounds interesting. What sounds interesting about that to you, right? Like explore it and, and be willing to grow. Um, therapists don't have to just be these like blank slate humans who don't exist in the world you can be you in the world and and still be a therapist so evolve and don't story. lose your own identity i've got a great story about that so our yeah. dance teacher is who's amazing uh, and that's kind of how i look after my mental health that's awesome um, she in 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 covid in lockdown she obviously went on to teaching people on zoom but one of the biggest issues is obviously left and right because you're obviously also in the mirror you know, you're mirrored on zoom as well so she had this great idea to go, right, have you got two different colored socks, like a blue and a red sock? So it's like, right, tell me which which feet your blue and a red are on. And then I'll just literally do blue, red, you know, blue foot. For, and that's how she did it. And she's taken that like offline as well now. It's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And I'm sure for people who have trouble remembering left and right, that's so helpful too. So helpful. Yeah. It's really yeah. Helpful. Oh, that's, that's great. The mother of invention. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Exactly. All right, what's been your most successful marketing technique to grow your practice? Media, one hundred percent. Getting featured in media and being uh, a go-to for outlets um, 
And do you use Twitter a lot to speak to the journalists in those organizations? No, actually. I So Twitter is like the one social platform where I go on and it's either like very depressing or like just porn. I don't know. It, like it's either like a dumpster fire of news or like my feed is filled with porn. I don't really know what's happening on Twitter. <laughs> it's it's a very confusing place. Um, I, so no, I I started. I took a a, a workshop essentially for uh, entrepreneurs to learn how to do their own PR a handful of years ago, and I built relationships with different journalists and writers and editors. Um, and now I just kind of like my inbox fills up with requests, um, which is wonderful. So n- no, I don't I don't really use it, but I do know that that is a great way. Uh, to connect with people. It's also like ever evolving and complicated. And Instagram is more where I hang out and and spend my time on social. Um, Mm -hmm. And I get plenty of clients from there too. Do you do any marketing, any advertising at all? Not officially, (laughs) not really. I mean, I I show up on social media often and consistently. Um, I create content. And between the content creation and the media mentions, that's that's basically my marketing. Awesome. And what are your plans for building the uh, the practice in the future? Um, well, I just expanded. Uh, it's a bit of a group practice now, mm-hmm. which is really exciting. I have some clinicians on board, and then I've also brought on some uh, specialized coaches. So people who are, uh, you know, certified in somatic sex coaching, um, things like that. And it's been so fun to be able to refer folks internally and then, you know, have it. It's so, so, so fun. So that was kind of my first step. Um, we'll see, we'll see what the next step is. I'm actually not sure yet. So I, I, I was looking at your, um, uh, the, the people in your practice today, you got a few now. It's great. Yeah. 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 There's a bunch and it's great. Cause someone will, you know, find me on Instagram They'll fill out the client consultation form, and then I go through personally, read what they've submitted, and I pair them, like I match them with the clinician or coach that I think is going to be the best fit. And sometimes that's two of them, and we send like two introduction emails with the acknowledgement that there's two people. That client will get to set up consultation calls with both, either whatever, um, and then start, start working with someone. Fantastic. We're going to put all the, the, the contact details to your Instagram and also your website, Wonderful. which is rightwrightnyc.com uh, in the show notes. So uh, let's talk about books for a minute. So if you, are you thinking of writing a book? Have you written a book? If so, what would the title be? Uh, I can't say the title because we are in the shopping process of my Ooh. book proposal with my agent. Yeah. Excellent. It's okay. Very exciting. Um, and a long process. I had no idea what the book proposal process was like uh, for traditional publishing. And boy, oh boy, is it a journey. When are you hoping to release it? Uh, well, it's not bought yet. So I I don't know. I hope that it gets bought by the end of the year. Like that's that's the goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll, I'll keep you updated. Fantastic. And again, we'll... Uh... We'll update everyone on that as we go through um, and you get it published, which is brilliant. On the on the subject of books, what is your favorite therapy book and why? Oh my God. That's so hard. Oh. What's the best sex therapy book out there? Come on. Oh, that's so hard. Okay. So I got to say, this is going to be an interesting, this is interesting. The best sex therapy book is not a sex therapy book. Brilliant. Um, the book Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski is so good. <laughs> and if you haven't read it, no matter what you do for work, no matter who you work with, please read it. Um, it is so dense with research, but that is broken down in a way that is so easily digestible. And I think is crucial to inform any practice, whether you're focused in sex or not. You know, it's the reality is, is that like we were talking about, sex is a giant part of everyone's life. Everyone, even if you're on the asexual spectrum, sex is still a giant part because it's surrounding you and you are not necessarily wanting it at all or as much. And that's still a very interesting experience. So 
as a therapist, like every client that walks through the door, virtual or otherwise, has a story around sex and we have to be comfortable talking about it. Mm -hmm. So I think come as you are is a really good place to either start or grow and learn. I mean, every time I reread it or go through another chapter, I'm like, oh yeah. And like, this is my area of focus. So that's, that's the book. Fantastic. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. So tell us a fact that blows our mind or tell us a joke. Come on, tell us a joke. Got to be a joke. That's one of a kind. And you, you could win or will win three months free membership to the Therapist to Millions membership. Oh my God. I'm so bad at jokes. Ah, no, come on. We haven't had a joke for ages now. (laughs) I don't have a good joke. I'm so, uh, I want to like Google jokes. (laughs) I'm, Okay, I can tell you the worst joke ever that I used to tell when I was a little kid. Go on. Okay, it's really bad. <laughs> I'm warning you. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. I was like three years old. I had this kid joke book. Why do elephants have so many wrinkles? I don't know. Why do elephants have so many wrinkles? Well, have you ever tried to iron one? <laughs> <laughs> I really like that joke. That's really <laughs> cool. Okay, it might be a three-year-old, but it's actually the best joke we've had for a long time. <laughs> yes. yes. That is uh, I love that. Huh? It's up there with my favorite fact I think that was ever told, which is about the jellyfish, which never dies. And I was like, what? That's a jellyfish that never dies? Yep. Wait, that's wild. I know. It's bonkers, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's okay. The facts and the jokes keep on coming. And that's absolutely brilliant. I love that. Uh, Rachel, how can people get a hold of you? How can people contact you? Uh, email, website, or Instagram are the the best three ways. Instagram is at the right underscore Rachel. And you said the website already. And then there's a contact form on there. And, and I'll email you right back. Super. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedule to, yeah. uh, to be interviewed by us on the show. And we really appreciate you for everything you're doing on the front lines of mental health. And uh, thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And uh, and stay well. And also I hope your foot recovers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Enjoy your weekend. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Rachel. If you would like to take part as a guest on the Therapist to Millions podcast, simply email me, damien at therapistamillions.com. That's Damien with two A's as all of the guests on the show will get three months free access to our Therapist to Millions membership worth $300. So if you would like to know how to write a best-selling book, secure a TEDx talk, create membership sites with content you don't even have to create, build client acquisition funnels, effective lead magnets, or your very own podcast, and way more besides, why not head over to thetherapistamillions.com and join our community of like-minded professionals. And if you'd like an additional $20 off your membership, simply type in the coupon code PODCASTLISTENER at the checkout.